Hey guys, this is Jeff Stanick again with Figured Out Baseball, here for another Figured Out Baseball podcast, and today we've got one of our own here with us. Uh, we've got Shane Davis, who is the pitching coach at Youngstown State University. Uh, Shane has has shot quite a few videos for us on Figured Out Baseball, so I thought it'd be a good idea to have him on on a podcast just uh, to talk about you know, talk about his videos a little bit, talk about, you know, why he wanted to join us here, um, you know, what he sees as an opportunity for himself or uh, with figured out, just kind of give it, give us his perspective on things and let you get to know him as a coach a little bit better. But uh, first, before we, we jump into questions with Shane, I just want to give you a little bit of background uh, on Coach Davis. Uh, he's at Youngstown State and he's actually a Youngstown, Ohio native. And uh, believe it or not, he was actually high school teammates with Youngstown State's current head coach, uh, Dan, Bernal- Dan Bertolini. Uh, coach Davis played collegiately at Eastern Michigan, where he was a four-year letter winner as a catcher. Uh, after he graduated from Eastern Mich- Michigan, he has spent the last 12 years as a Division I coach. This will be year 13 for him in the spring of 2019. He's had 23 players who have moved on to play professional baseball, including one major league player. He began his coaching career at Eastern Michigan, his alma mater. He was there in uh, the springs of 2007 and 8, where he was the catcher's coach and outfield coach, as uh, well as assisting with hitters. His 2008 team there won the conference tournament and uh, and got to go to the Ann Arbor Regional that year. And a funny little stat, which uh, hopefully we'll get into later a little bit, just kind of see some perspective on this. The team started 0-17 and, and went to a regional, which is really pretty miraculous in itself. Uh, after Eastern Michigan, he spent one year at the United States Air Force Academy in 2009 as the catcher's coach. That year, his catchers finished first or second in every defensive category in the conference. From there, he moved on to Cleveland State in 2010 and 11, where he was the catching coach and bullpen coach as well. He also spent a short time there as an associate scout with the Texas Rangers. From there, uh, he moved on to Western Illinois. He was at Western Illinois from 2012 to 2018, where he uh, started out as the hitting coach and outfield coach and then transitioned to be the pitching coach there. In his time at Western, he actually coached seven pitchers who went on to sign pro contracts. 2013, his closer was picked in the 20th round. He also had a pitcher voted as a freshman All-American that year, and that same pitcher, the freshman, set the school record with a 1.23 ERA that season. In 2014, he had another player selected in the 12th round of the draft. That's the highest drafted right-handed pitcher out of Western Illinois since 1970. Uh, that same that same pitcher that was drafted in the 12th round was also selected as a first-team all-conference player, the first pitcher to do so since 2006 at Western Illinois. Uh, he had four pitchers selected as conference pitchers of the week in 2014. That was the most in school history. 2015, he coached a player who became the program's all-time saves leader. He also received his master's degree in communication at uh, Western Illinois in 2015. In his time at Western Illinois, the team set a lot of school records. Um, he's got his names all over the record books there, joined Youngstown State, kind of moving back home. Uh, and He's a big part of what we do here at Figured Out Baseball. So, Coach Davis, we really appreciate you being here with us today. Appreciate you having me, Jeff. So let's just uh, jump right into <clears throat> to figure out baseball. So you and I have known each other for for a while. Uh, with you know people on figure out baseball, some of them I knew beforehand, some I have not. But you're you're one that I I go back a little ways with, and uh, I know that the first time that I contacted you about figured out baseball, it was almost an immediate yes, I want to be a part of this. And so you know part of this podcast is I'd like for people to just kind of get your perspective on things with the website as well as as get some insight as to you know, some some of the content that you've shared with us, but I just kind of wanted to know and, and let other people know what was it about uh, this venture that, that led you to kind of say like, yeah, this is definitely something I'd like to be a part of so quickly. You know, for me, it was, it was just the vision. And I think you and I uh, have a lot of overlap in how we see the game of baseball and how it should be taught. Um, the initial plan for it, uh, really attracted me because I think there are some barriers getting into baseball and getting information, um, especially when you get into more specialized things like pitching, uh, catching, um, some advanced hitting and defensive type of stuff. Um, a lot of those things cost money, and I think that's a lot of what what has driven some of the, I guess, decline in participation in baseball is the fact that that it's not just grabbing a basketball and going and playing around in the, in the driveway. Um, Baseball does have some barriers. So the affordability and just getting that information out 
Um, and the vision that was painted for me of, you know, somebody, somebody's son um, or daughter trying to get into baseball or softball and, you know, wanting to get that information, but making it more accessible and affordable and making it something that, you know, you could pull up YouTube at home or not YouTube, you could pull up the website at home um, and get just as good of information for a fraction of the cost that you would get going to an indoor hitting facility or a private pitching coach for $75 an hour. Um, I think baseball has given me a lot. And it's all about giving back and getting as much information and sharing as much information as you can with people. So I was on board as soon as you, as soon as you brought it up. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with uh, several of the things you said about the special, the specialization of the game, as well as the cost. Um, and, and the cost is one of the things that really drove me to, uh, I, I guess, just to figure out a better way to do things and different way to do things. And, that's one of the things that I'm most excited about is to be able to bring, you know, people with your type of background and your type of information, your type of, uh, uh, of education, your experience, pretty much like right to, you know, right to the home of, of whether it's a young player or a parent who wants to help their kid or a young coach, high school coach, whatever it is, just, you know, be able to give people really an inside look as to what you do at Youngstown state. I mean, what you, a lot of the information that you shared on, on figured out baseball is, is, it's exactly what you do with your players in college, is it not? Yes. So, I mean, r- really people re- are able to get a really good inside look as to, you know, what what college players are doing um, on an everyday basis. And I think sometimes people might have the idea that when they get to college, the things they're going to do are going to be totally different than they've ever seen before. And I don't know if that's always the case, but it's probably more consistency and, and having a better plan and, uh, but when it comes down to a lot of things you do are pretty simple, right? I mean, with, with your pitchers, you're not trying to do anything that you're not trying to reinvent the game or anything like that, right? You're, you're basically just trying to keep it pretty simple, find some things that work and help kids to be more athletic and, you know, figure out how to yeah. be successful. Yeah. And I, you know, I think I'm unique in, in my background that, you know, I haven't pitched since I was, I think 13 in pony league. So, you know, I kind of bring a different perspective to everything. And as a catcher, one of the first things I learned when I started coaching catchers is you practice and drill out the most, the things that you do the most. Um, And translating that into pitching, just the act of being repeatable, even though I'm not a huge fan of the word repeatable, but the act of being repeatable and the actions you do on the mound, those are things you want to practice the most. And sometimes when you get to our level, when you get to this level, there's a lot of guys that have been really, really good from a really, really young age. So a lot of those minor, seemingly minor mechanical things, um, they've been able to get by with being a little bit sloppy at doing uh, because of the fact that they were just better than everybody else. So you do sometimes have to, because of the talent gap shrinking, you sometimes do have to go back and do those things. And I really do think that the basics, um, are really important for you to hammer home and again practice the things that you do the most the most so let's talk about some of the stuff that you that you filmed for the website some of the information that you've shared where did you start uh, w- when you were kind of deciding you know w- really specifically what information you wanted to share what you were going to film on how did you decide just where to begin with everything you know, from the pitching end, I think a lot of where I started um, has to do with, I do think sometimes people overcomplicate pitching and overcomplicate a lot of aspects of the game. Um, essentially, essentially, all that pitching is is playing catch and playing catch effectively. So I've kind of designed what I've done to really hammer home just the mechanics and ability to play catch. Um, and I even got into it more in depth with my throwing program series that I did, but essentially everything from the two knee, from two knee wrist flips to working on more advanced things like uh, balance points, separation, uh, leg kick, um, getting into the windup. Um, I just wanted to provide everybody with something that 
whether you're seven years old, just starting out pitching to batters, or you're a high school senior, something that could be applicable. And I think, again, I think that it is sometimes overcomplicated. Sometimes it needs to be, but sometimes things are overcomplicated where we start, we start working on chapter five before we've really started, before we've really mastered chapters one through four. So the next obvious question might be, what are chapters one through four in your opinion? And, you know, what do, what do you see that young pitchers, and when I say young pitchers, I mean just guys before they get to the college level, whether they are 9, 10, or whether they're 16, 17, 18, what, what do people usually jump ahead to, and where do you see them kind of skipping out and not skipping out, but maybe uh, overlooking or not paying as much attention to some areas that they really should pay attention to? So what are chapters one through four for you, and what's chapter five based on what you just said? You know, for me, chapters one through four are all about, you know, training your body how to how to do things properly. I think a lot of I think a lot of problems and in my first video I talked about it stems with as guys are learning how to throw when they're young, it may not seem like it, but that glove is a little bit heavy. So because they're physically weak when they're young and the glove is heavy, a lot of times there's a lot of front side issues that just never get corrected that I think front side is really, really important and getting that, you know, push pull, bow and arrow, however you want to describe it, getting that, you know, glove side out and pulling your chest towards it sometimes gets overlooked because their, you know, habits were built when guys were young and then people kind of skip ahead and start working on other things. So I think that's that's one of the chapters. Another chapter is just learning how to use your legs. And we talked about it. We talked about it at length in my, um, at the end of my long talk video, videos, um, training your legs how to work. A lot of times everybody just thinks I've got to get my arm in shape. I've got to get my arm in shape, but you really do have to focus in on your legs. So I think chapters one through four are primarily going to be about that front side, that glove side, letting your arms work together and then involving your legs. And then I think as I see guys get older, one of the problems that I see is, you know, there's a little bit of, you know, watching a game, watching a big league game and trying to emulate guys, which is good, but not really studying it enough in order to really understand what they're doing. And I guess meshing it with what works for each individual player, um, which would be advantageous rather than, you know, just trying to see somebody and do what they do. Um, there's a fine line there. For me, I remember there was a time when you would go out and watch high school games. I'm sure you remember it um, about seven, eight years ago. And every other pitcher that came out tried to, you could see that he was trying to look like Tim Lincecum, but it was not <laughs> Tim Lincecum. And you know, same thing on the hitting side. I remember when I moved out to Illinois, we were about two and a half hours from St. Louis. Every other kid that would get in the box 10 years ago, you could tell he was trying to look like Albert Pujols, but he wasn't Albert Pujols. <laughs> um, so you've got to see what they do, but study what they do. Study what everybody does other than just the best guy and apply things that are going to work for you and adapt that into your game rather than just emulate. So is that what you would consider like chapter five where, where guys are trying to. The, the uh, more, the more advanced, the more advanced thing. Right. You know, once you say you're developing a pitching repertoire, you know, master the fat, master the fastball and then master, you know, a changeup and a breaking ball. If you're old enough, you know, master those things. And I, you know, I, I, we've all experienced as pitching coaches, the freshman in college that gets on the mound and you've got a 30 pitch bullpen. And he tells you, he's got a four seam fastball, a two seam fastball, a sinker, a slider, a curveball, a change up. And, you know, he's dabbled with dropping down and going underneath on all of those. And you start doing the math and those seven, eight pitches don't go very far where you're getting many reps in a 30 pitch bullpen. So, you know, kind of paring things down and get it, the ability to get good and master, you know, a fastball, a breaking ball, and a changeup first 
and then start working on other things. When you when you see young guys that have multiple breaking balls, I was just almost thinking back to myself in high school. I threw a, tried to throw a slider and a and a curveball, and I felt like I I felt like I needed to have more pitches. I threw a changeup as well. I felt like I needed to have four pitches to be able to have success. You, but in your opinion, it's easier, or, or I guess a, a better idea, a better game plan to maybe focus on two to three of those pitches as opposed to trying to develop four or five. And, and believe yeah, it or not, I, I also, Shane, was the guy that I tried to, from time to time, I dropped down <laughs> and would throw my pitches from the side, which I, I kind of heard coaches say later, it's almost like if you throw four pitches from over top and you try to throw a couple more pitches from down low, you're, you're really working on, like you said, seven, eight pitches instead of you know working on three or four pitches. Yeah, and, you know, I think it goes – I think a lot of times um, guys will say they have two, two breaking balls and, you know, in reality they have one <laughs> and they just call them different things. But I, you know, I think it's a case by case, uh, but in general, just from what I've seen, you know, usually when I look at, when I look at guys and when I'm coaching my own guys, you know, I learned if something's going to translate to the next level, keep doing it. If it's not going to translate to the next level, um, you better start thinking about making some changes. So, you know, there may be guys, and it may be possible to have, say, a curveball and a slider and be effective, you know, at Pony League or at high school, but it might not translate to the next level. Um, You know, like I said, just things that are going to get you out at the college level if you're in high school, stay with those. And it's okay to get outs with it, but if you, if it's not going to translate, but we shouldn't make it a priority. Again, it's all about being, being really good at something before you kind of move on, be working on something while you're doing it, but master something before you dive into another thing. And the people who are listening to this podcast and are interested in checking out your videos, the things we've talked about so far, you have shot video and, and put them on figured out baseball to, to cover these areas, correct? Um, yes. And, What I may not have covered, um, for instance, pitch selection I haven't gotten into yet, um, is going to be coming. But the but the Um, like basically chapters one through four, like you're talking. Chapters one through four, I have pretty much hammered home. Okay. And you know, kind of, I guess if we're going by chapters, you know, chapters one through four I've hammered home, and then kind of the transitional chapter was my throwing program, and then we started getting into more advanced things like building the building the wind up um, balance points and things like that. Okay. You mentioned a few minutes ago, just about being, if you're old enough to throw a breaking ball for anybody that's listening, that's maybe is a, is a younger player or parent of a younger player. What are your thoughts on when it is safe for kids to start throwing a, a true breaking ball? You know, I think as, I think as guys develop physically, so it's going to change a little bit. Um, Definitely. You know, I would say by high school, if not a couple of years earlier. Um, but again, it goes back to what is your focus? You know, are you trying to, if you're, if you're honest with yourself, are you trying to, you know, win the Little League Championship at 12 years old and probably not really remember much about any of the games you played when you're 25? Or are you trying to develop yourself into a pitcher? Um and be successful as you progress through the game. Um, I don't think it, I don't think it hurts when you're 13 years old to be able to flip a breaking ball occasionally. But you know, if you're really trying to develop yourself, be able to compete with your fastball, um, and then be able to add as you go along. So it is case by case, but stay with everything, you know, with the end game in mind rather than quick satisfaction. You said early on that you and I are pretty similar about some things, so I'll be anxious to see what your answer is to this. Um, I personally have a hard time watching the Little League World Series because there are so many breaking balls thrown by by young kids who are, you know, really probably shouldn't be throwing like 40% breaking balls. Do you have any thoughts on that? Is you, you think that's something that maybe – I know the Little League World Series is really touted as something that's it's so amazing to watch, and it's fun to watch those kids compete, and I agree with that part of it. But I, there are some things about the Little League World Series I'm just not a fan of. Not that I want to go into a total, you know, yeah. divergent about that. But do you have thoughts about that? I mean, just based on what you just said, it sounds like 
kids at that age, 10, 11, 12, really shouldn't be throwing a lot of breaking balls, maybe an occasional breaking ball, but not a lot of them. That's not, but that's not what you're seeing on TV because they're trying to win, you know, the little league world series. Yeah. And, you know, first off, I've, I've actually been to the little league world series and I would rank it right up there with, with world series games and and NFL playoff games that I've been to as far as coolest events I've been to. So, um, I did enjoy it as well, but yeah, it's, I think it's detrimental to growth. And again, there's guys that there's guys that can do it and are physically developed when they're 12, or I guess some of these guys are 13 that are playing in it, but by and large, the physical development isn't there to be able to withstand that action. And, you know, the little pronation at the end of a good breaking ball. Um, And as 12 year old kids, they're not as good at the monkey see monkey do where there's going to be something mechanically. That's probably a flaw that might increase the risk for things happening. Um, But I keep going back to it and I'm sorry, but I think it's really important to, you know, be able to compete with your fastball. And that's a problem that I'm sure you ran into too, is you'll get some guys that come to college and have really good stuff but you ask them to compete inside with the fastball. You ask them to, you know, locate a, a good move, fastball with movement down and get a ground ball. And sometimes they're not able to do it, but they've never really been asked to. And again, when you're at the division one level, a lot of the guys that you get um, are a lot better, have always been a lot better than everybody they're playing with. They haven't really had to. So I think being able to compete with a fastball is important. And, the other thing, I don't have any data in front of me, and I don't even know if there's any out there because it would be really hard to track. You know, there's only a handful of guys that have made it to the highest levels of baseball that have been competing in the world in the Little League World Series. And, you know, I look at my Little League team that we, we made it to the state tournament, so we got at least out of our district in Little League. You know, I was the only one on my team that ended up playing a division – well, I was one of two guys that ended up playing a division one sport. I was the only one that played baseball. Um, and there were some really good guys and full, full disclosure. I was about five foot 95 pounds when I was 12 years old. Um, so I wouldn't have been able to do any of that stuff. Um, and there were guys on my team, two of our best pitchers, one ended up a defensive end at Duke and the other one was fully grown throwing a ton of breaking balls when he was 12 years old and didn't even make our high school team. Um, So, you know, what happens in little league does not really matter in the grand scheme of things. Um, And I think this is important for people that maybe aren't that good right now, relatively speaking, that there's a lot of growth between the time that you're in 12 years old and the time you graduate high school that you need to focus more not that winning is not important. I think it's important to learn how to win and to learn how to lose at a young age, but realizing that there is an end game and an end goal. And it, it, it isn't necessarily winning the little league world series. Not that it shouldn't be a goal aspiration and dream. Um, but I'd imagine if you ask, if you ask anybody playing in playing in college baseball or anybody that play, goes to Omaha next summer, um, would you rather win in Williamsport or win in Omaha? And they're going to say win in Omaha would be my guess. Yeah, I would agree with that. A couple things, a thing that you mentioned a couple times that you have touched on, but I'd like to get maybe get your full definition on it. You've talked about competing with a fastball for kids at a young age, and, and there are a lot of uh, young listeners to this and parents of young players who are listening to this podcast. Um, when you when you say that the first thing you should learn as a pitcher is to be able to compete with your fastball, can you define what you mean by that? Yeah, I think I think there's a couple levels of it. It's having confidence in it, um, whether it's the hardest one, the fastest thrown one in your league, or just average or below average. It's having confidence in it and having command of it to throw it where you want, when you want. And, you know, I talked about it in my throwing videos. You know, the difference between control and command, control is throwing strikes. Command is getting the ball to go where you want, which sometimes can be a ball. Um, Being able to compete with it. And I think a lot of it is being willing to 
get hit, have contact against you and being able to being able to get past it and even being able to give give up hit. And that is competing with your fastball. Um, you look, strikeouts are up right now at the big league level. Um, and just the nature of the game right now with all the different things out there, everybody is concerned with velocity. You know, arguably the two best pitchers, I'll go in each league, you know, the two best pitchers, probably Corey Kluber and Chris and uh, Clayton Kershaw in the National League, neither one of them have what you'd consider an above-average fastball. They have really good breaking stuff. They have impeccable command, and they're able to compete and get fastballs where they want, when they want. And they're both very good, and they still get strikeouts because they're able to pitch. Right, and Kershaw's fastball is kind of taking a step backwards the last couple of years, but his – you know, he's still very, very competitive. Um, yeah, and, and Corey Kluber's about 90 to 93, might be able to get it up to four, which is about average at this point in the major leagues. And, you know, he's got, he goes stretches where he'll go seven, eight, nine, ten starts without allowing a walk. Yeah. And for little league age kids and even kids that are, you know, middle school age kids, and frankly, I, since I've, I've coached some, you know, high school kids, Competing with the fastball, you know, control is is obviously the first step. Command is, you know, when you've got a lot of when you've got good control and you throw a lot of strikes, then you can start being a little more fine with it. But I, I think it's got to start with just being able to throw a lot of strikes first and not walking guys. And I can speak from personal experience when I, you know, I, I went to a high school that we weren't very good. I played, you know, summer ball with teams that weren't weren't very good in high school, and that's just kind of what we had at the time. There was not a travel team around me when I was in high school, and um, it was hard for me as a pitcher to to let guys make contact because my de- my defense was so bad. It's like if somebody makes contact, hard contact, soft contact, didn't matter. You felt like there was a pretty good chance they were going to get on and people were going to score runs. So it's not an easy thing to do depending on what kind of team you're playing on. But if you're, if you are thinking about, you know, I, I want as a young kid, I, I want to play in, I want to play in college. I want to play pro ball. It, it really is important to almost in a way overlook what's happening right now and and the type of numbers you're putting up right now knowing that the development of this pitch and being able to throw it for strikes and at some point being able to to actually command it you know throw a fastball in when you want to throw a fastball low and away when you want to that's really almost more important than than having some short-term success yeah and two two things you know i i think that i think that um you know, I talked in my meeting at the end with our with our pitchers. I brought up two guys. One was actually the pitcher you referred to of mine that was the first first team all conference guy that we had. Um, his first two years weren't very good. Um, he was, I want to say, he was about seven and seventeen in his career um, at Western. Um, his draft year, he topped out at ninety seven. Wow. But he, but he lost to baseball games um, because that command wasn't there as much. And I remember same same time period, we went down and played Missouri State, and they had a guy, I don't know if you remember Petrie, um, if you ever played them. Um, he was about 85, 87, right-hander. You know, if you looked at him, you wouldn't say he's a stud college baseball pitcher, but he was a three-time All-American. And he just kept hammering the ball down, down, down in the zone and getting out. And I want to say he lost three games in three years. He ended up a draft, and I think he got hurt and he's out of pro ball now. But, you know, those are two guys, one that was 97 with better stuff but less command, and then a second guy that had a little better command with not as good a stuff. And one was the three-time All-American, and the other – you know, it was really, really good, and he was a first-team all-conference, but he lacked a little bit of the command. Yeah. And then the other thing is, you know, I think there has to be an ability to kind of segment things out and be able to realize, you know, like you were talking about with being afraid to give up hits because of the defense, being able to realize that baseball is – it's an individual team sport. Um, you've got to – you've got to focus on the task that you have at hand and, you know, have faith that your teammates are going to do something behind you. 
Um, all that you can control and all that you can worry about is the things that you can control. And that's, do I, did I make a quality pitch? And did I either miss a bat or induce weak contact? Um, from there, it's out of your hands. Um, there's a reason ERA doesn't count against you when you give up an unearned run. Yeah, that's a great great point, and it's a really a very difficult thing for a young player to realize that you know the things that are out of your control, like basically what happens when the ball leaves your hand, is totally out of your control. I mean, even how many times you you throw a good pitch, you throw it where you want to, and it still gets barreled. You know, it just it happens sometimes, and there's not much you can do once that ball leaves your hand. Very hard concept for a young player to understand, but but really it's important. It's hard for college guys to understand. Oh yeah, yes. Hard, heck, it's hard. It's hard for a lot of big leaguers to deal with that. Yes. You know, it really is. It's, it, it probably never gets easy, I would say, but but it's something that you need to understand if you're going to continue to play at higher levels. Let's talk about a couple of the other videos that you've shot. Um, so far, I, I know that you're you're still in the process and hopefully we'll continue to shoot more, but why don't you tell I us am. about maybe a couple other videos that, that you've done so far or have in mind, and uh, just to give people a little better idea of, you know, what you're thinking, why, you know, what you're contributing and, and why you're doing so, why you've why you've chosen to talk about the topics that you have. You know, every, every video I do, I try to, I guess, think of a market that, that I would have for the video. And most of them I'm thinking, is this going to be something that, you know, an eight-year-old or an 18-year-old would be able to get something out of? Um, again, I'm trying to, every video that I do, um, I'm trying to come up with something that you could do with a towel or a bucket of baseballs in a net or the side of your house um, or a fence. Don't tell your mother. Um, <laughs> but I'm trying to come up with things that you could do in limited space with limited resources. Um, and again, a lot of them, the balance point drills, the, wa- the hip separation drill against the wall, um, the toe flicks. Um, I'm trying to figure out things that are going to help you to maximize your lower half, get your body working together. And again, things that can be used in a tight space. Um, I really, really like the towel drill that I did with the back against the wall, um, where it's forcing you to keep your, keep your front side in tight as you follow through. Um, and then I'm also excited about starting, you know, I've, I've got one video so far and I'm going to get a couple more up there just kind of talking through the recruiting process and marketing yourself. Um, You and I, I'm sure at some point have talked, you know, you go to a camp or showcase um, or whatever, and, you know, there's a lot of guys there and you're almost looking for reasons to cross a guy off um, because the reality of it is I do believe that there's a place for everybody to play. um, But, you know, if you look at, if you take a hundred baseball players, there might be three that are at an event um, that are, you know, the Bryce Harpers of the world, the ones that when Bryce Harper was in high school, the ones that anybody in the world, you could, I could take my mother or grandmother or aunt um, and sit them at the ballpark and they'll say, those three guys are really good. And then there's another three so that takes it to six there's another three that you can tell right away are not very good and then the reality of it is that other 94 in that group there's very 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 little separating them and that's my part of my job is figuring out who needs to go where and who's a good fit for us but the difference between that middle big part of the bell curve is very very small so you know you go to an event little things like you know, just having a shirt shirt on that might have a cuss word on it, or like I said in the video that I did on this, you know, not wearing a belt, um, not having a hat, you know, having a having pants on that you could tell haven't been washed in a month and a half, um, you know, walking in with your mother carrying all your stuff. I was just gonna bring that up. <laughs> you know, those are little those are little things that seem little and might not have any bearing on how you are as a player or how you are as a person. But again, when you're trying to delineate differences between that big meaty part of the bell curve, that night, those 94 guys, 
you know, you're looking for things that in a short period you could say, I'm going to cross them off. And it honestly happens too. I'll look at it and I'm sure you have, you know, you see a guy in some of these places you go will have GPAs and ACT scores listed. Um, it could be as simple as I see somebody with a 2.8 GPA, but a 32 on his ACT. I'm going to think, you know what, this guy might be a little bit of an underachiever or he might be lazy in the classroom because obviously that 32 should translate to something better than 2.8. And those are all things that in that quick, in that quick couple hours span of time, you're looking at and trying to gather as much information as you can to make decisions. So allow yourself to be looked at in the best light. And, you know, something as simple, like I said, as, um, wearing a belt or up here in the north, um, you know, we'll run camps. We have a beautiful indoor facility with a hundred yard football field. Um, you know, even as even simple, since some, something as simple as showing up with a pair of shoes that you're going to wear into the facility and having a nice pair of shoes, not necessarily because you're looking to, you know, looking to get better traction, but simply just because you care about somebody enough that somebody has to clean that facility or, you know, we've got a multi-million dollar indoor turf field, just, hey, I don't want to ruin their turf, so I'm going to bring in some dry, clean shoes to wear. You know, those are little things you could do that might not be the reason you end up at Youngstown State or Florida State or uh, Moorhead, uh, but they might be the reasons why you don't or play into the reasons why you don't. I've I've said kind of the same thing to kids. Uh, you know, I've I've worked some things before, especially since I've left college baseball. I've worked some camps where I end up uh, giving a recruiting talk. You know, because as as someone who's not in the game anymore, I'll, I I can be, you know, fully honest, full disclosure about basically anything that people want to know. Because I'm not uh, I don't have an objective anymore. I don't I don't have a, you know, I'm not trying to talk kids into coming to camp anymore. Um, you know, so I, I, I've given those talks and that's what I've said to kids is basically, you know, when you show up to a camp, you've got a very small period of time where you have a chance to make a good impression. So you've got to let that coach write as many, as many plus signs next to your name as possible and very few minus signs and, you know, one or two minuses, you know, one or two things in a minus column, you might, you might cross yourself off for that day just because like you said, that these coaches have to make decisions on a kid in like a three hour period. They have three hours to figure out whether or not you're the right player for them. And if you do a couple of small things that just, you know, don't, uh, don't quite jive with what they do with their own team, that, that could be it for you. Yeah. Um, I, I think those are, uh, those are really, really good topics that you have covered on the website and, and more things that you're going to cover. Um, I, I wanted to just kind of hit on one thing. I, I don't want to keep you too much longer coach, but um, you talked a little bit about, about when you create video, you kind of want to create video that would work content that would work for an eight year old and an 18 year old. Yeah. And one of the things about the website is that um, we, we sort of tag each video with a level, level one through five, you know, whereas one would be something that would be appropriate for an eight, nine year old and a level five would be something that would be, you know, for a varsity baseball player, a guy who's, you know, who's close to playing college, maybe he's already committed to college, maybe he's a chance to get drafted, you know, that pretty advanced type of player. If, if we label a, a drill level one through five, that means that the drill is, uh, or the video in general, it doesn't have to be a drill, but the video in general is relevant to an eight-year-old and to an 18-year-old. And my fear is that, one of my fears of the website is that the 18-year-old looks at that video and says, I don't need to do this. Like I've, I've already, you know, I'm, I'm 18 years old. I'm committed to go to, you know, to a division one school. Like I don't need to worry about this drill, but I, I really think that's a mistake. And now, you know, I, I don't like to interject much in these videos, but I know for me as a coach, as a college coach, you know, the, the, the basics are really important because obviously you want to continue to progress with guys and, and teach them the really finer points of the game, the better they get. But when a guy struggles, you always come back to those basics, you know, what got you there in the first place. And, and there was a, there's a saying that I'm sure you've heard. And a lot of other coaches have too. That it's, it's the kiss system, you know, keep it simple, stupid. And, and sometimes guys overcomplicate the game and they want to learn, 
kind of going back to your earlier reference, they, they want to, they, they feel like they know chapters one through four. So they want to jump to chapter five, six, seven, and they're ignoring the stuff that, that really built their base, you know, for success in the first place. And I do think that that's a mistake that people make. And, I, and it's something that I am a little bit concerned that people, you know, might look at a video that's labeled level one through five and say, well, I'm, I'm way past a level one. I don't need to watch this drill. I'm just going to watch videos that are labeled, you know, four and above because that's what's meant for my age group. I'd like to get your thoughts on that. Obviously I, I kind of gave my thoughts, but I'd like to know your thoughts on it as well and see what your perspective is on that. You know, exactly. And I, you know, as you were talking, I was thinking back to this past, this past spring or summer, um, you know, being, being an Ohio native, I am Mr. Cleveland Indian. Um, I actually drove to Milwaukee to see the Indians and Brewers play. And you know, I got there early enough, which I usually don't have a chance to, but I got there early enough to watch everybody warming up and moving around the field. And I was on the Cleveland side, but I remember distinctly watching Jan Gomes, who was an all, and I'm going to talk in catcher uh, parlance, but I remember watching Jan Gomes, who was an all-star this past year and one of the better defensive guys in, in baseball. Um, I remember he and Sandy Alomar, who, a lot of you younger guys listening won't remember, but most of the parents do, and I know you and I do. You know, he was a rookie of the year, multiple-time all-star catcher, um, one of the better catchers that's been around in my lifetime. I'm Absolutely. a little biased. Um, but those two guys, while I think it was Corey Kluber starting, Corey Kluber's doing his long toss, and those two guys went out in center field, and they were just working on barehanded receiving drills. Um things that I would do, and I've done lessons at different points, things that I've done with 10-year-olds, um, Jan Gomes was doing in a, before he was getting ready to catch Corey Kluber um, in one of his starts. And a lot of, you know, transfer drills, a lot of barehanded receiving drills, um, just as simple as Sandy standing up and just firing balls at him so he could work on his hands. Um, so those guys are doing it. If those guys are working on simple things daily, um, we should as college guys, high school guys, little league guys. Um, you know, the other point I'll say, and, you know, you've been, I guess, I guess somewhat fortunate enough that you've been somewhat further south in your coaching career. But um, it's been a couple one years thing now. I've seen and you'll see repeatedly, and it might not always translate into wins and losses, um, but it does. Um, you know, a lot of times the Northern teams, and it's a little bit different now that, you know, everybody, um, it seems everybody other than a handful of Northern division ones have a, have an indoor really nice facility they could use, but definitely back when I was playing and when I started coaching, you know, we'd go out and play somebody down in the, down in the South and we'd come out of the gym and I'll tell you what, we might not be ready to see, see balls in the sky. We might not be ready to see everything else. But we're going to be really, really good at bunting. We're going to be really, really good at fielding bunts. And we're going to be really, really good at running PFPs on the mound. And that's partly because that's all we could do in there. But those are simple things that translated into us, if not being able to win games, being able to compete against sometimes teams that, you know, when you look at the rankings, are a little bit higher than you. Really good stuff. I, I, I actually would like to, if you got a couple more minutes, Coach I David, got all the time you need, man. Okay. I'd like to ask you a couple of things just that, that kind of came up in your bio that I think are interesting. Yeah. Um, first, I, I would like to ask you about the 0-17 start at Eastern mm -hmm. Michigan. I have been on some teams, unfortunately, that have had really poor starts. I've been on some teams, fortunately, who have had tremendous starts to seasons. Um, I, I know it was a long time ago, but 2008, take me back there and, uh, you know, how did a team possibly recover? from 0 and 17 to go on to win the conference tournament and, and go to a regional? You, you know, it was, it was an interesting year and that was my second year coaching, um, you know, going back to the 07 season. So year before it, um, you know, we went 32 and 24. Uh, we went 21 and four in our, in the, in the max. So in our league um, ended up losing to Kent state in the championship game of the tournament. But, you know, we returned a lot of guys from that team. I think we might have lost – we lost our Friday night pitcher and our starting shortstop, but had 
you know, replacements for them. Um, you know, Matt Shoemaker that's pitching in the big leagues right now, just signed with Toronto. He transitioned from our closer in 07 to a starter in 08. So it was a veteran team that knew how to handle things. And we kind of had a little bit of a perfect storm where we had a coaching change in the fall and coach boss came in and was lucky enough. I was lucky enough to stay on board with him for that year. Um, so we had a little bit of getting to know you phase and just a little new system on how we're doing things. And, um, you know, that was coupled with a really tough schedule. You know, I went through it with you a little bit ago, you know, we played our 17 games were four against New Mexico, um, four against university of Florida, or actually two against university of Florida, four against Florida Atlantic three at Tennessee and two at Kentucky and then two against Wright State. So it was a daunting schedule to start with some, with some really, really um, difficult games highlighted by, highlighted by a 24 to three loss against Florida Atlantic in front of our South Florida alumni association. Low lighted anyway. Uh, Oh, it was, it was lovely. Um, (laughs) But the, the interesting thing about that team, and I think partly because they'd had success and there was a culture, uh, culture that we were going to win and we knew we were going to win that, you know, there was no panic on the guys. And they did a really, really, um, especially looking back and being another 10 years advanced in my career, they were really special in that they, they showed up every day fully expecting to win. Um, and what happened the day before had no bearing on any of them, um, that they just went out and competed. And, you know, for instance, you know, that 34, that 24 to three loss to Florida Atlantic the next week, you know, we went down to Tennessee who at the time, Tennessee had, you know, three, they had, I think, Jan Gomes, J.P. Aaron Stevia and Julio Bourbon. Who all, were, who all played in the big leagues. You know, we go from 30, 24 to 3 to the next three games, we lose 6 2, 8 7, 5 1. Um, all tight games. And we started playing better as we went along. Um, but I think the biggest difference was two things. They handled that adversity and kind of wiped the slate clean every night when they got home, got in the shower, did whatever they needed to do, wiped that slate clean and showed up the next day ready to win. Um, And then, you know, the last loss, we lost five to four to Wright State. Um, And I'm pretty sure we were walked off in that loss. But, you know, I'll never forget getting back to the hotel in Dayton after that loss and you know, Coach Boss just kind of said, you know what, I'm out, I'm out of things to say. Um, yeah, we did get walked off. Uh, Shuey, uh, sorry, Shuey, if you're listening to it. Um, <laughs> you know, you've moved on to bigger and better things, but you were the guy that got knocked with the L um, in that walk-off. But, um, you know, Jake, Coach Boss just kind of said, I'm out of things to say to you guys. We had a senior, senior heavy team. Just said, I'm getting off this bus, and you guys are staying on here until you figure something out. Um, and I know, you know, Mike Boyd and Sean Hoffman and Shoemaker and a couple of the older guys, uh, Jeff Davis. You know, I can name off that whole team, Josh Ivan, but you know, those guys I know kind of took charge of things on that bus, and it was a good 45 minutes to an hour before they were off the bus, and you know, they took the reins from there. And, you know, from that point on, um, with some, I'd like to thank some coaching help, but, you know, from that point on, they go from 0-17 and and they end up going 14-8 and in conference. We ended up with 34 losses. That's including the regional run. Um, So from 0-17, we went 24-17, and uh, which is a pretty big turnaround. That ended up going undefeated in the conference tournament and, you know, losing two tight, tight games in the regional tournament. So, you know, it was a lot of just handling that adversity and being able to, uh, you know, kind of like I said with the pitching, being able to compart, or yeah, being able to handle adversity as a pitcher, being able to compartmentalize uh, things that happen and, you know, have confidence in themselves that they were good enough 
they were good enough to move on and, you know, move past that and win and realize that conference, in, in a sense, is a whole different season for us. Uh, but there were a lot of special things throughout the year. We had, um, you know, we had a couple guys get walk-off wins that were the last guy on the bus. Um, going on, well, not going on the bus, last guy on the bus, so to speak, because we were home um, in walk-offs. But, you know, last guys on the roster having walk-off hits and, uh, you know, I think back-to-back days and extra innings against against Miami, Ohio, um, that opening weekend in conference. Things just started building. It was very much one of those things that, you know, everybody believed in each other and did their own thing. And, you know, I remember that year we had High Sox Sunday that, you know the program under Coach Coriel was all about everybody wore their wore their uh, wore their pants down around their ankles. You could only see a little bit of little bit of uh, socks. But you know Coach Boss said, you know if we want to do it, we're going to do it on Sunday. But everybody has to do it, and that was kind of like a rallying for us, rallying thing for us that we just bought into and bought into our identity as a team. So sorry I was short winded on it, but I'm a little bit. <laughs> passionate about that team no it's a great story and and you guys might be the only zero and 17 ever to make it to a regional i mean it's really the, the, really other, the other cool thing about it is the regional was at um university of michigan and if anybody follows me on twitter i'm a big pro wrestling fan and the steiner brothers who were wwf wrestlers and wcw back in the day um Big Papa Pump Scott Steiner was walking around that regional, so I got a little starstruck <laughs> a little bit too. That's hilarious. <laughs> um, I want to ask you. There's a couple other things that I just I think are are unique to you, Shane, and and I, um, you know, I, I think they're worth talking about. So you you then coached at Cleveland State. You were at Cleveland State when the when the program folded. I think that's like the worst nightmare for for a lot of coaches. What was that like? Obviously, you landed on your feet, and, and things have worked out for you. But what was that like at the time when you when you found out? You know, when did you find out? What was that like on the, for the coaching staff there? You know, it was it was unique, and I had actually, you know, I had flown in a recruit from Northeast Junior College in Colorado uh, the night before. So we were we came back from. We were at Valpo on a road series, and I I had a rental car. I drove. I picked up the recruit at the Camp Macron Airport. You know, started the visit. It was a Monday. Started the visit like any other visit we'd ever done. Um, I was at lunch with one of my players. I found out we had a meeting um, with the athletic director, but I had a recruit, so I had to take him around. Um, I was at lunch with the recruit and one of my players, and I got a text from Rob, our other assistant, saying, you know, don't tell Chuck, our player, um, don't tell him, but baseball is because the athletic director wanted to meet with them. Um, don't tell him baseball's been dropped. So I was sitting at Winking Lizard in downtown Cleveland <laughs> trying to figure out how to get through the rest of this, get rid of my player, and break the news to the kid from Colorado um, that there's no need doing any more of the visit. Uh, there's no more baseball. So I ended up wow. dropping off my player, and um, as we're walking towards my car, I kind of turned to him, and our field was off campus. I kind of turned to him and said, you know, there's really no sense going to the field um, unless you really want to because baseball has been dropped here. And he said, well, I don't really want to see the field. So I said, well, <laughs> you're flying out. <laughs> so I told him, you're flying out of Camp Macron at about – it was about 2 in the afternoon. I said, your flight's not till about 6. Um, I'm not going to just drop you off with four hours to go uh, before your flight. So is there anything you'd like to do before you left Cleveland? I said, yeah, you know what? I'd like to see the, I'd like to see the pro football hall of fame and I'd like to see Lake Erie. So we actually drove, we actually drove up the Erie Lake shore halfway to Sandusky. Um, and then I took him to Canton and it was closed. So we sat in and walked, sat in the parking lot and walked around the pro football hall of fame. Um, then I dropped him off at the airport and then my right in God, God bless the kid. Cause I was between getting players from calls from my players, me calling other coaches, you know, dropping a couple expletives along the way. <laughs> uh, he handled it really, really well, but 
you know, I dropped him off and then simultaneously I was looking for a job while, you know, essentially turning into a junior college coach. And I was reaching out to, you know, friends that I had made, friends that I had in, in coaching, you know, trying to help guys get on to better, get on to other places if they wanted to. Um, you know, we were, we, I was, like I said, I was a junior college coach. I was trying to promote players. We had other programs coming in to watch practices, coming in to watch, watch games. So it was almost surreal. Uh, but I got that, you know, I talked about how much I love that Eastern team, that team at Cleveland State I got really, really close with because, in a sense, it did take away a little bit of the coach-player barrier uh, where we were, you know, at that point. At that point, I wouldn't do it now, and I haven't done it before or since. You know, I would go out to dinner with a player and things like that um, after that happened just because we were all really jolted. Um, yeah. Fortunately, though, I think – coaches and players, everybody ended up um, in a better place um, that they either got, they either had their um, school paid for on the scholarship that they were on at Cleveland state or moved on to bigger, better places um, and are happy for it. You know, I'm fortunate that, you know, I'm indebted to over that summer, I was looking for a job and, you know, John Masaccio at Oakland at the time, had a volunteer position that I had conditionally accepted, but, you know, I was, he allowed me to search for another job while I was pretty much secured that I was going to go work for him. And then, you know, fortunately at the end of that summer, um, Todd Coriel, who at the time was at Western, um, he and Mike Milano, cause Todd was leaving, helped to get me in at Western Illinois on a, uh, on a paid position and as much as it hurt me because I thought Moose was a great man and a great coach um, and one of my best friends in coaching and one of my first friends in coaching, you know, he understood that, you know, a volunteer position in a fairly high rent district in Metro Detroit um, financially wasn't good and recognized that it would be better for me. So, you know, he allowed me to go. So it was, it really came down to those three guys helping me to stay in coaching or else God knows what I'd be doing right now. Yeah. It's funny that, uh, that, I mean, there are some, a lot of good guys in the game that, uh, that help you, that they you know, to do the right thing for, even if it's not the right thing for them, not the easy thing. And I think probably anybody that's, that's coached college athletics that, you know, in any sport probably has a couple of stories like that, where I don't know where I would be right now. If this if this happened or if this didn't happen, I know I've got a couple, uh, you know, myself and, you know, but obviously you've ended up, things have, have worked out like they seem to. And, uh, and, and right now you're, you're coaching at uh, division one school, very near home and, and obviously in a pretty good place. And it sounds like uh, just from talking, for, you know, from knowing your program a little bit from knowing you personally, I think that some good things are, are about to happen at Youngstown. So uh, I guess, you know, to say you landed on your feet would be, uh, would be pretty accurate once you once yeah, that happened. And, and you know, it's 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 funny because you know I I like in my communicating with players and just my nature. I I like to talk about anything and everything and try to find ways to apply it to baseball. But you know, I talk with pitchers a lot, and I remember we had a pitcher. I had a pitcher at Western Sam. Um, Sam and JT were the two that I had at Western that he, that the three of us separately. So I would just have hour long conversations with those guys, just about, you know, the mental side of handling things. And a lot of times it would always come back to, you know, just have faith that, you know, if you're doing things the right way and doing things how they should be and putting in a conscious and concerted effort, um, Things might not not might not always happen how you want them to, um, but they're going to end up how they how they're supposed to be. Um, and your judgment of success may change, but you can at least look yourself in the mirror and either say I gave it my best, or you know this is the plan for me based on what I did. Um, this is what karma's brought me. So as long as you do things the right way, whether it's on the field. Um, you know, playing the game the right way, training the game the right way, or in life, just handling yourself the right way. Um, you're going to make mistakes, but, you know, man up to it, own up to it. And, you know, you're going to land up on your feet. And you're going to end up where you're supposed to. 
Really good advice. Great insight from a, from a very good coach. Guys, this again has been Shane Davis. He's the pitching coach at Youngstown State. Uh, a really down to earth guy with his you know feet firmly on the ground. I, I think a guy just really gets it. You know, just just gets the game, gets what you know the significance of it is beyond what happens on the field. And uh, Shane, we're we're really very blessed to have you as a part, as a really invaluable uh, part of the Figured Out Baseball staff, um, and, and somebody who's you know who's done a lot of good things in the field and will continue to do so at Youngstown. So we we really appreciate you spending time today uh, with us on the podcast, letting us you know giving people a better insight as to who you are you know, some of the videos you've done, and uh, we're really excited to see what you do in the future here uh, with Figured Out Baseball. Excited to be here. All right, Shane, thanks a lot, and uh, good luck to you guys this spring. Thank you.